Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm honored to introduce to you uh, my former mentor and internationally renowned pediatric pathologist, Dr. David Parham. Dr. Parham has 40 years of experience in the diagnosis and classification of uh, childhood diseases and special expertise in pediatric sarcomas. He's been actively involved in this area since the beginning of his career at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where he first developed commonly used ancillary tests for the diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. He served as the initial chairman of pathology discipline for the Children's Oncology Group, the COG. He served as the president of the Society of Pediatric Pathology and has published several textbooks and many articles and book chapters on the subjects of pediatric disease in general and pediatric cancer in particular. Dr. Param recently retired as the Chief of Anthemic Pathology at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Today, he will talk to us about the fascinating story of rhabdomyosarcoma and its evolution over the past 50 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Param. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is going to be a first for me. I've never done a lecture in this fashion before, but I'm sure we're all going through a lot of first uh, to make us uh, appreciate what it's not, how nice it is to have a conference where you get to have live interaction. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about rhabdomyosarcomas, which is a subject uh, near and dear to my heart because of a long lifetime of experience working with this particular lesion. I became interested in 1981. Uh, at that time, I started at St. Jude, and it was the, and continues to be, the most common soft tissue sarcoma in children, about 50%. Soft tissue sarcomas being about the fifth largest group of childhood malignancies. And at that time, uh, Sarcomas were a regular challenge, so I had a few sleepless nights over difficult cases. At that particular time, the diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma required the identification of cross striations, as I shall demonstrate right here. Now, these could be very difficult to find, and I learned as an optical tip to lower the condenser and increase the illumination. That's something that's not published, but uh, it does help to see these particular structures. Uh, at that particular time, one of the uh, major textbooks and uh, I would say the uh, generally accepted criteria for diagnosis were published in the AFIP fascicles. At that time, there was a second series that was uh, written uh, by Dr. Raphael Lattice at Columbia, and in his opinion, uh, these uh, tumors had to have eosinophilic cytoplasm and cross striations. Without that, without those features, the diagnosis could be challenged. The problem with this particular criterion is that tumor cells in rhabdos range from very primitive and non-classifiable mesenchymal cells to cells that recapitulate. Uh, normal embryonal myogenesis. And in many cases, there are no detectable differentiating features, even as Dr. Stout and Lattice uh, had already stated in their first uh, version of the Spasical Series 2 on soft tissue. Uh, in this particular instance, the identification of the tumor as rhabdomyosarcoma can be extremely difficult. And unfortunately at St. Jude, I seem to get more than my share of these particular variants. Uh, Dr. Lattice later on in his revised uh, fascicle stated that unfortunately the diagnosis has become popular and is often applied indiscriminately to a number of undifferentiated sarcomas without proof of rhabdomyoblastic origin. Uh, this is a problem because uh, the top diagnoses in children, I call them the big four, a rhabdomyosarcoma, neuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, and lymphoma leukemia uh, are the major things to treat. And unfortunately, clinicians do not like a diagnosis uh, 
of undifferentiated sarcoma because they feel that it is uh, not clear what they should be treating with. And as a result, they put a lot of pressure on me for the diagnosis. At that time, the only major ancillary technique uh, was electron microscopy, which required special techniques, preservation, and again, you had to search for signs of muscle differentiation. I remember one, one of my mentors saying, his mentor had told him that if he had his life to spend over, he wouldn't have spent it looking for all of those damn striations. But this particular uh, technique, uh, electron microscopy, did allow one to demonstrate the presence of filament bundles, thick and thin filaments with Z bands in, uh, electro in myoblast, but the problem was we still had to do a long search. Again, you could search up to three hours sometimes to find a single cell. This is an illustration of the thick and thin filaments with the Z disc. Uh, here's the Z disc material, here's the filament, and one of the criteria that Dr. Erlinson came up with was these uh, ribosome myosin complexes. Uh, to illustrate the problem, here's a paper that was published by Dr. Harriet Kahn. Uh, she studied 65 cases. Uh, this published in 1983, and she found striations in only 25% of them, and 13 were examined by EM, uh, finding striations in four. So not much difference there, 25% versus 31%. At that time, there was a new tool being um, investigated, immunohistochemistry. And this particular paper from a couple of my colleagues at St. Jude uh, used uh, a very primitive method of uh, developing sera. They simply ground up rhabdomyoblast and developed antibodies to that particular uh, mixture. So without knowing exactly what they had, it was very difficult to to actually duplicate these experiments. The first leading immunostain uh, at that time appeared was uh, known as myoglobin, which is an oxygen binding heme protein found in cardiac skeletal muscle. And it was also useful, but the problem was, as in this picture, it tended to only stain the uh, cells that already were obviously rhabdomyoblast. And so uh, it didn't really help very much. Uh, and the other problem was it seemed to leak out and be uh, taken up by non-muscular cells such as rhabdomyoblast or the ad adjacent skeletal muscle. Since most of these tumors occur in muscle, that doesn't help either. Here's an illustration of a case that's a non-rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, strongly myoglobin positive. And you notice the skeletal muscle uh, next door where the myoglobin probably leaked out of. Uh, Dr. Kahn also addressed this particular marker in her 83 paper, and you see that uh, it did improve a little bit, so the sensitivity goes up to 37%, but still less than 50% of cases. Now this particular antibody came out around the same time, just a little bit after uh, myoglobin, and it was Desmond, uh, because of a major landmark paper describing five intermediate filaments published by Dr. Elias Lazaridis. And at least two of these papers uh, tested this antibody to an intermediate filament in uh, rhabdomyosarcomas and found that they definitely had utility. The major paper in this was published by Dr. Chuang at Baylor, uh, and this is a very large series of cases. And he found indeed that uh, rhabdomyoblast rab and rhabdomyosarcomas uh, were very sensitive. This is a very sensitive marker in muscle tumors, both skeletal and smooth muscle, but notice also that it lacked uh, some sensitivity, uh, some specificity, because 
you see eight of 89 diverse sarcomas uh, showed staining. And also all you had to have was tumor associated desmoplasia and those myofibroblasts would also stain. Here's an illustration of this stain showing that it does indeed improve on the uh, myoglobin because it will stain more primitive cells. Now, I think the big landmark paper in immunized chemistry was this particular paper appeared from Dr. Weintraub and Dr. Lazar's lab describing a helix loop helix protein that formed a dimer acting as a transcription factor because this was a myogenic determination transcription factor. This became known as MyoD for myogenic determination. This particular uh, protein uh, interacts as a dimer, but uh, it appeared to be more complicated than it originally seemed because there seemed to be a whole family of proteins that could interact both upstream and downstream uh, with this particular marker, including things like myogenin, uh, MRF4, PAX3 as an initiator, and so forth. Sonic Hedgehog also in there. And you see this is a very early event in the embryo, just in the somite stage, where the somites become laminated into a uh, myofibroblast. Uh, this particular, hold on just a second. I'm having problems with the slideshow. Uh, let's take this off. Okay, sorry. Uh, this particular one shows strong immunostaining uh, that Dr. Uh, Peter Dias found by using antibodies against this particular marker uh, and also with MyoD. He was the first person to work with MyoD and then uh, another lab uh, in uh, Washington came along and worked with myogenin and found these were both good markers for diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcomas, even in very primitive cells, such as you see here, cells that would be fit into the uh, so-called small round cell tumor bunch with no myogenesis. So this particular paper uh, by Dr. Watt, uh, Steve Qualman, uh, with the first author, Dr. Marotti, uh, recommended that a trio of markers, Desmond, MyoD, and Myogenin, should be used for diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. And this has been the standard ever since. So, so I think the idea of diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma has become a much easier uh, problem because we can use these immunostains to develop uh, uh, to recognize rhabdomyosarcomas that cannot be recognized by either light microscopy or electron microscopy. Now classification of rhabdomyosarcoma uh, first began actually I would say in this paper in, 19, in 1894 uh, which came out of uh, the uh, lab of Dr. Berard uh, in Lyon, and this particular one called attention to several things. Number one, it was the first paper to use the term rhabdomyosarcoma. Secondly, it called it an embryonal tumor, which was a new concept. And then thirdly, it showed that this particular lesion had features of embryonal muscle. So that became the first description of both rhabdomyosarcoma and embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. There were previous papers that may have described rhabdos, but they did not use the term. This illustrates the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma with the primitive undifferentiated cells punctuated by scattered masses of differentiated myoblasts, very similar to what you see in an embryo. Uh, Botryoid rhabdo came about the same time, and this was actually a gross diagnosis. And this was because these tumors formed these grape-like masses 
that occur in uh, genital urinary sites that they became known as botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma, independent of uh, any microscopy. However, using microscopy, there was a characteristic finding that was described known as the cambium layer. As we see here, this thickening of cells beneath this epithelial surface. Uh, things rocked along until uh, 1956, well, when this landmark paper came out of Montreal, and it described a lesion that had the features of al primitive alveoli, uh, became known as uh, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, only a very few cases actually were described, only six cases, just showing you how you can have a small series and have a major impact. Uh, these patients were all older, uh, and they tended to occur in uh, the extremities, perineum, and uh, in orbit around the head and neck. Uh, then finally, I think the fourth major category was described in 1946 by Dr. Stout uh, using the term pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, and this became known as the most common uh, form of rhabdomyosarcoma in adults. You see this marked uh, age peak here around 40 to 45, whereas it trails off in children. Uh, now the term pleomorphic rhabdo was not used, but the term pleomorphic cells were used because these tumor cells, as this illustration shows, actually show these large pleomorphic cells in vaguely Storiform pattern. So the storiform pattern became embroiled in a controversy as to whether these were malignant fibrocysticytomas, now called pleomorphic sarcomas. But we now know that indeed, based on immunomuscle staining, that these are indeed rhabdomyosarcomas. The first classification then appeared in 1958 from doctors Horn and Innerline. Uh, they described then uh, a classification of four different tumor types in rhabdomyosarcoma, pleomorphic, alveolar, embryonal, and botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma. And they called attention to the fact that these tumors could be stratified by age location and tumor location. For example, the pleomorphic tumors tend to occur in older adults in the extremities. Alveolar tumors occurred in teens and young adults in the extremities. Embryonals occurred in young children in the head, neck, and GU tract. And botryoid tumors occurred again in young children in GU tract, head, and neck, and bile duct. Of note, only seven of these 39 patients were alive at the time of the publication. And this included only three pleomorphic adult tumors, all of which were recent excisions without adequate follow-up. And the ones that had longer follow-up included four cases of, of uh, pediatric tumors, in both an embryonal and botryoid. This suggested that there was a difference in behavior according to histology, but the series was just too small to make that a uh, statistical point. I will have to say that others were more sanguine about this classification business at this time. For example, Dr. Stout and Lattice in their fascicle had stated that the multiplicity of names seems unnecessary when it's realized that these tumors are extremely, extremely malignant and fatal, so why, why does it matter? And then secondly, Dr. Gonzalez Cruz in Black Schaefer wrote this paper in 1979 that said, current classifications seem to disregard the morphologic heterogeneity of these tumors. Uh, in their paper, of their 32 cases, 10 of them had mixed histology, and fully one quarter did not seem to fit into any definite morphologic classification. 
The real proponent, however, of doing classifications was Dr. Bill Newton, who wrote the first large series showing the value of classification. This particular series, for one thing, set out the classic percentages with about 50% being embryonal, 20% being alveolar, 5% botryoid, and only one in this pediatric series, by the way, uh, was uh, pleomorphic. They also included these other cases. Note that there were five cases where they couldn't really make a determination because they were inadequate tissue, and there were eight cases where they just couldn't make a decision as to whether they were truly rhabdomyosarcomas. And in at that particular time, extraosseous humans was being entered on this particular therapy protocol. Dr. Newton also showed a definite correlation between survival and histologic classification, with the botryoids having great outcome, alveolars having terrible outcome, and embryonals being in the middle. Uh, there were several other classifications that appeared, uh, including the International PSYOP classification, the uh, NCI classification, and the IRSG cytological classification. Here is the uh, PSYOP classification, which came from Europe. Uh, this is Dr. Caillot's paper showing uh, the incorporation of uh, differentiation into this particular classification. And you will notice that there did seem to be a difference according to differentiation, but the major thing was alveolars had worse outcome compared to embryos. Uh, Dr. Sokos and Trish at the NCI, working with us at the St. Jude, uh, published a paper on another classification scheme whose major thesis was that alveolar rhabdos did not have to have an alveolar pattern, but had, could have sheets of similar cytologic round cells resembling lymphoma. And this was called solid alveolar. And as you see, the solid alveolars did just as bad as the classic pattern alveolars. Uh, the final classification is the IRSG cytological classification promulgated by Palmer. Uh, this particular paper is from a manuscript and has never been published because you won't find a, an article. It was only published as uh, uh, posters, uh, presentations at, at uh, cancer meetings. And you see here, they had unfavorable and round cell tumors based on purely cytologic grounds. And then they had a good prognosis, spindle cell, and intermediate was everything else. So if you round, wound up in this anaplastic or round cell group, you did badly. And if you'd round up in the other group, you did everything else, you had a good prognosis. Now note that round cell would incorporate most, if not all, of the alveolar tumors. To make sense of this burgeoning group of classifications, an international study was organized by Dr. Newton and the, international, and the intergroup RAPDO study to determine which study uh, worked the best. And this is a, the international group here. This is Dr. Newton in the center, and yours truly here. Uh, the results were published in this paper by a statistician, Dr. Lena Asmar, and it showed out of 800 cases that, guess what, uh, the horn inner line had most uh, agreement, most people were familiar with it. All of them showed a relationship to survival, and the kappa ranged from 0.32 to 0.45, indicating that you only had moderate agreement among classification of rhabdo, even among experts. But the results did le lead to a new international classification a la working classification of, lab, rap, of lymphoma at the time. Uh, and this, uh, this was a superior prognosis with the botryoid and spindle cell, intermediate prognosis with embryonal, and poor prognosis with alveolar and undifferentiated sarcoma. Uh, 
The problem, though, with this new classification was the distinction between a dense embryonal and a solid alveolar. And a dense embryonal could be the tumor where it was all the dense, undi poorly differentiated cells with little or no obvious myogenesis versus a solid alveolar tumor. And you see you can only make the distinction based on subtle uh, cytologic clues, mainly the roundness of the nuclei, because these still tend to spindle out and these are round. And another problem came up as to what to still call mixed alveolar embryonal tumors. Uh, this was Don, Dr. Gonzalez Cruz's a complaint, and it's persisted. And then finally, there was a new category that I'll talk about later that was described uh, the sclerosing uh, tumor, which has this broad bands of fibrosis with these small aggregates of uh, tumor cells. Uh, and this was actually recognized by the IRSG as an alveolar tumor. And in this particular paper by Dr. Qualman, comparing institutional and review diagnoses, there was only 80% agreement between the review pathologists and institutional pathologists for embryonal only 63% for alveolar, and it went down for only 15% agreement for botryoids. So agreement was very poor at that particular time. Now at the, the same time, a new technique was coming along. This was the first paper showing the effect of cytogenetics and rhabdomyosarcoma. They had only one patient that had a characteristic profile uh, that showed this 213 uh, alterations that became known as the T213, and that was an alveolar tumor. Became later recognized that the alveolar 213 was associated with patients with very bad outcome. This was later further refined by Dr. Barr into the PAX3 forkhead gene fusion, where the translocations came together. As we see here, oops, sorry. Uh, go back. Uh, we had either a fusion of PAX3 or PAX7 with this forkhead gene on 13. So you could have a 113, 213 with this particular tumor, as I like to say, 113, 213, 13 being unlucky. Dr. Sorensen reviewed the results of a large series of cases, 78 alveolars, and he found that most of them are PAX3, a smaller number were PAX7, an even smaller number were fusion negative. And in his particular paper, you see the PAX7 tumors did the best. Uh, the PAX3 tumors did the worst, and there was this big drop off with fusion negatives, which were kind of in the middle. But notice that still a relatively small number of cases. As we learn more about fusion tumors and about classifying tumors as alveolars, it became apparent that we were changing the landscape of PAX negative uh, alveolars. Uh, initially, PAX negatives were about 22%, and then uh, it dropped down in the IRS4, it was 23%. But after the publication of this new classification, the number of fusion negative cases went up to 46% which was unacceptable compared to the previous number of cases. At the same time, the number of alveolar tumors was markedly increasing. As we see here, it went from 25% up to 41% with alveolars. So it was apparent that something was wrong in classification. 
I think the major problem was we said if you had any focus of alveolar, that became an alveolar tumor. Now here is uh, a paper that appeared, again, I think this was a major paper by Dr. Davisioni showing that when you looked at morphology alone and you looked at genetic uh, expression uh, profiles, you didn't see a particular pattern. You see this mixture of red and green. But when you look at fusion, all of a sudden, the uh, red cases were fusion negative and did not show a pattern like the embryonal where you have this tight genetic signature for those tumors that have the 213 and 113 or the PAX at that time, uh, 4KED became FOXO1. And this, this PAX FOXO1 gene status then on more papers as we acquired more and more experience it became obvious that it was not histology driving prognosis, but rather it was the fact that these tumors were having, uh, were either fusion negative or fusion positive. And the fusion negatives were driving the, the, the prognosis down. Now, uh, this particular paper, uh, which I'm a co-author of with Dr. Skapek, we see the graph here. And we see the fusion negative cases don't do any different really from, uh, alveolar, from the embryonals, whereas fusion positives do uh, definitely worse. Uh, however, I will say by this time you see that in general, as years have progressed, we've done better and better in treating these patients. So I guess to summarize where I'm going with this, uh, to classify rhabdos, then uh, the best thing to do is to use fusion testing. And in fact, this is what the COG has currently been doing in order to classify patients. They all have to have fusion testing, and if they become uh, fusion positive, then they're high risk. Otherwise, they're put into an intermediate risk unless they're metastatic. Now, I want to take the remaining time and cover some of the uh, newer developments in rhabdomyosarcoma and classification. And newer developments include the following, the heterogeneity of spindle cell rhabdos, the emergence of new entities, such as epithelioid rhabdo, well-differentiated rhabdo, histiocyte-rich <coughs> rhabdomyoblastic tumor, osseous rhabdo, and a new diagnosis uh, in the differential diagnosis is uh, MPNST with complete rhabdomyosarcoma differentiation, so-called triton tumor with no MPNST obvious. Now, spindle cell tumors, as I mentioned, was described by Dr. Uh, Nigel Palmer at the IRSG. Uh, Dr. Cavazana wrote another paper describing this tumor being a spindle cell lesion, mostly occurring in the paratesticular region of children. And you see this uh, spindle cell uh, pattern, which looks like a leiomyosarcoma or fibrosarcoma. The sclerosing tumor was elucidated by Dr. Andrew Folk, and you see these uh, sclerosing areas, as I showed earlier, separating these clusters of more primitive looking cells. And uh, the World Health Organization picked up on the fact that there seemed to be intermediate tumors, so they put both of these into one category, the spindle cell sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma, which is separate from embryonal rhabdo. So that has been the major change that's come along in the past 10 years. Uh, however, it's not so easy because uh, it was obvious that spindle cell tumors in adults did much worse than spindle cell tumors in children. 
And in this paper by Dr. Alagio and uh, Dr. Christina Antonescu, uh, we see that you can actually separate these tumors by fusions with the congenital uh, infantile spindle cell tumors having VGLL2 fusions. This is the most common type in uh, the infantile. And in the infantile tumors, these are all spindle cells. Uh, they have these NCOA2 fusions with TEAD or SRF. I want to come back to SRF and NCOA2 later. Uh, older patients outside of the infant range tended to have this uh, MyoD1 mutation and uh, less common, some of them had this coexisting helical mutation in PIK3CA. These particular tumors tended were all sclerosing rhabdos, whereas these were spindle cell rhabdos, indicating there is a difference uh, at the molecular level. Dr. Antonescu uh, was the uh, senior author of this paper, uh, again, and I want to point out a couple of things. Now, first, infantile spindle cells were all truncal lesions surviving after three to nine years, uh, even though that the majority of them were stage three. Uh, the mixed tumors were mixed locations, and all of them were dead, after one to three years, this is the group where the MyoD mutations were prevalent. So we see the separation based on the presence of a genetic change with this one having the low grade change and this one having high grade change. So my question is what happened to paratesticular tumors, which was the most common location in the uh, IRSG series. And uh, this has not been elucidated. I think we still do not have a firm molecular grip on whether paratesticular tumors fit into this group at all, even though majority of spindle cell rhabdomyosarcomas are spindles are uh, paratesticular. I will say though that I've noted that these tumors tended to have focal embryonal areas, so perhaps they fit more into the embryonal tumors. The other uh, new category that's come along is the uh, epithelioid rhabdomyosarcoma described by Joe et al. in Dr. Chris Fletcher's lab. His series was all adults. Uh, this was expanded by uh, Dr. Zen et al. in Dr. Elagio's lab to five pediatric patients. And so uh, these tumors have this epithelioid uh, features with no obvious rhabdomyoblastic differentiation by light microscopy, minimal degrees of pleomorphism, unlike pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma in children and adults, but containing rhabdoid cells. And it's been recognized that sometimes rhabdomyosarcomas do strongly resemble rhabdoid tumors. And I think that is a mixture that's probably reflecting uh, at least some relatedness to these epithelial rhabdomyosarcomas. Uh, these have uh, characteristic myogenin and desmin positivity, ind indicative of rhabdomyosarcoma. They uh, have uh, retention of I and I1, uh, indicating they're not rhabdoid tumors. Uh, and the CK is negative or only focal, weakly focal, indicating they're not true carcinomas. And finally, the negative S100 rules out melanoma. Now note that of this two papers, all of the pediatric patients survived, whereas uh, about half of the adult tumors were dead of disease, again indicating a difference between pediatric cases and adult cases. There's only been one good molecular study in the pediatric group, and one of those patients had an acquired mutation in NF1, but otherwise we still don't have a genetic handle on these tumors. Here's a picture of this particular tumor, and we see this characteristic epithelioid features. Notice it almost 
looks like a squamous eddy here. Uh, and it, uh, even though there's nucleolide, the tumor cells really look pretty similar one to the other. They are all uh, large round cells. Uh, and you notice these prominent nucleoli, which would sometimes give a resemblance to uh, rhabdoid tumor cells. Now the next new category just came out a month or two ago. This was uh, published by Dr. Koranian and Dr. Tarod's lab. Interestingly, this particular lab is in Lyon, so this goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, so you can kind of sandwich the oldest paper in with the newest paper at the present moment. They described a rhabdomyosarcoma, a rhabdomyoma like rhabdomyosarcoma that occurred in infants. These were all paraspinal neck tumors. They were incompletely excised, treated with uh, chemo and alive with disease. 12 to 180 months after therapy. Of note, they found fusions of SRF, again, going back to that paper with spindle cell tumors, uh, and the fusions occurred with either FOXO1 or NCOA2. Now, I will say, I don't know if I've seen one of these cases, but I will say that the differentiation between rhabdomyosarcoma and a benign rhabdomyoma can be very tricky, as we see here. I actually call this particular case an uh, infantile rhabdomyoma, even though it does have some primitive looking cells. Why did they call it? Here's, I think, the, uh, the bottom line on these cases. If they were rhabdomyomas, they would have well differentiated cells, location in the neck, very young patients, none of them metastasized. There were very few or no mitoses and no necrosis in this particular group of tumors, which would favor, in my mind, these actually being rhabdomyomas. But they favored a diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma because of, they had infiltrative margins. They had cellular atypia, they recurred. This does occasionally happen in rhabdomyoma. And uh, finally, they do have these FOXO1 or NCOA2 fusions. Now, whether or not these are rhabdomyosarcomas or rhabdomyomas, the most important thing about this paper, to my mind, is the fact that you cannot trust a FOX01 fish result as a sole determinant of whether something is a alveolar rhabdo. Based on this paper, it could be uh, actually this well-differentiated rhabdomyosarcoma. So I guess that puts us back in business uh, for histology. This is the uh, next paper that's come along in recent times. Uh, this is the histiocyte rich rhabdomyoblastic tumor. I don't have an example of this in my uh, collection. I don't know if it's ever been described in children. These were all adult tumors described by Dr. Martinez out of Dr. Folk's lab. Uh, and uh, these are 10 adults, these well-circumscribed nodules, and they contain numerous macrophages, sheets of macrophages, that obscured uh, rhabdomyoblasts. So the only way you could really pick them up well was to do these muscle stains showing them. Uh, and again, one of them did have an NF1 uh, mutation, but uh, none of them had fusions or myOD mutations, and there have been no metastases or recurrences, so the jury is still out as to whether these are benign or malignant. Uh, the last new entity in the rhabdomyosarcoma pantheon is this intraosseous rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, this was described by Dr. Argaram out of Dr. Antonescu's lab. Uh, these were seven patients, uh, all young adults, again, no children. Uh, they were bony tumors occurring in the pelvis, femur, or skull that were positive for myogenin and desmond and all of them had these gene fusions. Now, of interest, uh, two of them were spindle cell lesions, and they had this uh, 
NCO, NCOA2 fusion, which we talked about earlier and has also been described uh, with PAX2 to PAX the fusions. And then others uh, had this uh, translocation that's very reminiscent of Ewing's tumors with either FUS or EWS, uh, but with a new partner, TFCP2. Uh, one had a FUS translocation, but the other partner was not uh, identified. And uh, this particular group had tumor, uh, positive ALK1 and cytokeratin of note. But there was a difference in histology because this particular group, like the NCOA tumors in young children, had spindle cells, whereas this group with the Ewing or FUS translocation had uh, more of a epithelioid feature. Now here's a picture of a uh, tumor that appeared to be a bony tumor that I took actually when I was a fellow at Memorial. Uh, this was a rhabdomyosarcoma. It appeared to be coming from bone, but it does illustrate the problems, sometimes determining whether a soft tissue tumor is invading bone or vice versa. Uh, and I will say that the presence of these fusions does add some weight to the idea that there is a primary intraosseous rhabdomyosarcoma. Now the final thing I'm going to talk about today is this paper that came out uh, last year by Dr. Hornick uh, and uh, Dr. Nielsen on uh, uh, tumors called that they called uh, MPNST or malignant peripheral nourishing tumors with complete rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Uh, now first I'll say that rhabdomyosarcoma is a well-known tumor in the group of tumors that occur in NF1 patients. They don't seem to behave as well as the patients that don't have NF1 with rhabdo, so they do seem to do worse. Uh, and this particular paper just looked for spindle cell rhabdomyosarcomas, uh, and they found two that uh, based on uh, Next generation sequencing, they postulated to be NPNST in spite of the fact that they had no evidence of residual uh, nerve sheath tumor or S100 positivity. Why did they make this diagnosis? Because of the NGS um, features, including deletion of NF1, CDKN2A, and SUS12, uh, and NF1 mutation with loss of 17Q11. So that was an acquired mutation. All of these things were felt to be molecularly characteristic of MPNS2. And of note, by immunochemistry, these lesions showed complete loss of H3K27 MEC3 uh, in a non-mosaic pattern, which indicates that rhabdomyosarcomas with complete loss of this tumor should have NGS sequencing because they may be indeed MPNSTs. So, uh, gets us back to uh, the triton tumor uh, described because these were growths that come out of patients based on a nerve sheath. Uh, triton tumors are the ones that arise. Triton salamanders will uh, give rise to a limb if one is torn out, as long as the uh, nerve is intact. So they were called triton tumors, and this is a lesson in how uh, bizarre, how wide ranging myogenesis can be. So I want to summarize my talk that uh, rhabdomyosarcomas continues to amaze and intrigue generations of soft tissue pathologists. I've shown you the beginnings of the, of the diagnosis, and I've shown you the fact that the papers are still appearing, uh, describing new entities. Uh, and this is linked to the fact that neoplastic myogenesis can be
caused by a wide variety of genetic initiators. And because of this, new entities will probably emerge, but these are more and more sporadic and rarer. So whether or not they will actually make a huge difference into these multi-institutional uh, therapies is another question. So I'd like to end there. I think I'm on time, actually uh, a little earlier than I thought. Uh, so I'll take questions now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody with any questions, please? Thank you. Uh, Oh, Thank you sorry, so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, you started by saying this was your first uh, presentation online. I think you, uh, you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we, we would like to hear your thoughts uh, on the uh, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation as a heterologous element in uh, malaria and uh, carcinosarcomas because as, right. the pra as our practice evolved now, we are putting more emphasis, or, or gynae-oncologists are putting more emphasis on the epithelial component as the main right. driver of biology. And, and frankly, uh, I personally feel that we miss uh, foci of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. You already pointed out the subtlety in morphology. Uh, so uh, we would like to hear whether you think we should apply ancillary testing uh, constant, consistently looking for them. Uh, you raise a very good point, uh, and because of the time, uh, I could not go into all of the various diagnoses, carcinoma, sarcomas, melanomas, that can have a large degree of rhabdomyoblastic uh, differentiation. Uh, and this just points out, as you allude to, the fact that, you know, there's all, a lot of different tumors that can turn on this program. Uh, these are mesenchymal tumors, and I think one of the reasons this happens is because uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, uh, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation is just kind of the uh, go-to pathway if you mesodermal cell and you have neogenesis. Uh, now, second question you talk about is about the Mullerian tumors. Uh, that is a very uh, well-recognized uh, tumor that can show a lot of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation just as Sertoli cell tumors, Sertoli Leydig cell tumors in the ovary, I've seen those become nothing but rhabdomyosarcoma after recurrence and metastasis. Uh, I, I don't know a lot about those. I think one of the things you can rely on with these tumors is a characteristic uh, zap fusion, but uh, there's another reason to be uh, concerned about these, and that is the fact that uh, dicer-based tumors also can arise in the uterus and cervix, uh, and they could indicate a dicer family, the dicer gene being associated with rhabdomyosarcomas of the uterus and cervix, and also with pleural pulmonary blastomas, which can be largely rhabdomyosarcomas. As a matter of fact, all of the uh, lung rhabdomyosarcomas that were described in the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma study actually were switched over to pleural pulmonary blastomas, just showing you how it's, again, it's just so many ways that these tumors can be shifted into a myogenesis pathway uh, and the only thing we can call rhabdomyosarcomas is those that don't have an apparent initiator that points to another direction as a tumor. So that's a long explanation, but I think, yes, it is important to do molecular testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parham, for, for that uh, very fascinating and uh, educational talk. Um, I want to piggyback on that uh, previous question and the comment you made. 
um, this time in the context of uh, testicular teratomas. So sometimes we do see rhabdomyoplastic differentiation right. uh, in the testicular teratomas. Um, the problem right. that I have come across several times is that these um, mature, these are partially, uh, partially mature tumors. And um, at what point do we actually start calling them uh, rhabdomyosarcomas arising in the context of a testicular teratoma because that would change the therapy. Um, the other thing yes. is, um, is there a way we can use the immunohistochemical markers in showing us where these tumors are uh, in terms of uh, the evolution? Like uh, if we see a, a myogenin positivity or myoD positivity, could we say that these are earlier in the differentiation and therefore equivalent to a rhabdomyosarcoma? And if those are absent and only desmin or muscle specific actin are present, they are later in the differentiation. Right. So they are more towards a rhabdomyoma and therefore probably um, a benign tumor arising in a teratoma. What would be your thoughts on that? Well, you raise several good points there. Uh, first, uh, the teratomas, absolutely. Uh, I've seen uh, tumors that have uh, yolk sac tumors in particular uh, that will change into rhabdomyosarcomas when they have the stromal overgrowth syndrome. Uh, and then they change either into rhabdomyosarcomas or I think osteosarcomas, angiosarcomas. Very analogous to nerve sheath tumors. And uh, do they respond to rhabdomyosarcoma, pro the protocols? Unfortunately, I have not seen a lot of response uh, to the secondary rhabdomyosarcomas to rhabdomyosarcoma therapy. I, I know I had some experience with the patients with, for example, sertroli lighting cell tumors, uh, and they did not respond at all to the standard rhabdomyosarcoma vincristine atriomycin cytoxin or VAC therapy. Maybe that'll change in the future as we, we come to know, but the fact is what, you're, what we're talking about here is not the tumorigenesis uh, of the lesion, but the fact that it is secondarily becoming myogenic. So I don't think the driver of the neoplasm is necessarily the same thing as the driver of the myogenesis. And you got to be careful about this. And the therapy that we use only works, it seems, in the ones that have primary myogenesis as a primary lesion. So uh, I wish I could say that myogenic tumors would respond to myogenic therapies, but that's not the case. Now, secondly, you raise another question about uh, can you use immunohistochemistries? chemistries? Uh, I think yes and no. I used to say it's completely foolproof, but now we're seeing some tumors that have myogenesis uh, as a secondary component. I just showed you uh, this uh, nerve sheath tumor. I think nerve sheath tumors on occasion can show Desmond positivity uh, before they become rhabdomyoblastic. Does that make them rhabdomyoblastic tumors? No. Uh, I've seen it in uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors. But again, Desmond is not as sensitive as myogenin. But uh, I would be careful. And I particularly have been seeing more and more papers recently describing something I have observed, and that is that rhabdoid tumors will on occasion show myogenin and myoD and desmond positivity, which is no surprise because uh, they have a very basic transcription elaboration. So uh, can you show evolution? Uh, that's possible. It's possible, but I don't think it's necessarily always the case. Thank you so much. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, we will conclude today's presentation. This is the last Grand Rounds. Um, we will have the summer off, come back to you early September. We want to thank Dr. Parham and 
Dr. Marugan for joining us this morning and hosting. Everybody have a, a great um, summer and stay well. <laughs>